use values are only produced by capitalists because, and insofar as, they are the material substratum, the depository of exchange values. Our capitalist has two objects in view. In the first place, he wants to produce a use value that has a value in exchange, that is to say an article destined to be sold, a commodity. And secondly, he desires to produce a commodity whose value should be greater than the sum of values of the commodities used in its production, that is, of the means of production and the labour power that he purchased with his good money in the open market. Marx now takes us to the realm of capitalist production and the creation of the prime in the circuit MCM prime, or as he previously called it, the surplus value. But to get to the bottom of this, we must first understand what it is that the capitalist desires. Firstly, they wish to produce a commodity that people will buy, something that has a use value so people desire it and wish to purchase it, thus giving it an exchange value. Secondly, they wish to produce a commodity that has a greater value than the amount of value it took to produce it. There's no profit for our capitalists, if the hat costs them £10 in labour and production costs, and the total value of the hat is £10. To understand the production of surplus value, we must look at the production process in further detail. Let us now return to our would-be capitalist. To begin, and remembering that value is only ever created in the labour process and the socially necessary labour time embodied within, we must remember that this is also true for the materials and tools that have been obtained by the capitalists for production in the first place. Let's say, for example, our hat is made from cotton and it takes one roll of cotton to make one hat. We'll say, for example, that the value of one roll of cotton is seven pounds. The value of this cotton does not disappear when turned into a hat just because it has changed its shape. The value of the cotton within the hat is still seven pounds. It is now just a different form. If it took two rolls of cotton to make a hat, the value of £14 would be transferred. Likewise, if it only took half a roll, then only half the value, £3.50, would be represented in a hat. Let's also say, for example, that a specific tool, that is the value of £4, is needed for turning cotton into a hat, but this tool breaks after every two hats made. So in the making of one hat, the tool transfers half its value two pounds into the hat. Finally, let's also say that the determined value of labour and its socially necessary labour time for the labouring of cotton into one hat is one pound. This labour process Marx calls useful labour, the transformation of old dead labour and its respective values being laboured into new use values, new commodities. Useful labour is the labour that creates value within the production process. The labourer here is paid the value of one pound, and in return they have given back the capitalist the value of one pound in the cotton in the hat. Value for value. Now our finished hat has the total value of ten pound, the cotton of seven pound, half the tool's value of two pounds, and the useful labouring process that brings these items into a new form and the creation of new value one pound. These separate values are now all concentrated into one thing, the hat, but so they were in the original sum of ten pounds before it was split up into three parts by the purchase of the commodities. The capitalist here has a problem. The value of the product is exactly equal to the value of the ten pound capital that they advanced in the beginning. There is no surplus value, no extra money. What really influenced him was the specific use values which this commodity possesses of being a source not only of value, but of more value than it has itself. This is the special service that the capitalist expects from labour power, and in this transaction, he acts in accordance with the eternal laws of the exchange of commodities. To understand how the surplus value is created, we have to first remember what the value of labour power actually is. If we remember from the previous chapter, the value of labour power, just like every other commodity, is the socially necessary labour time that is required for the production and reproduction of itself. That is, the value of labour power is the value of everything that is required for the labourer to perform their labour power. Theirs and their family's food, clothing, 
a roof over their head, their education, all the things that are necessary for the labourer to continue to produce and reproduce their labour power. For our example, we will say that the value the labourer requires for one day of producing their labour power is one pound. Let's just imagine that this is enough for one day's food, clothing, shelter and support for their family. And as we previously imagined, let us again say that the value of labour power of turning one roll of cotton into one hat is also one pound. Let us also say for this example that this labour process takes six hours. So in six hours, the labourer has exchanged value for value. The labourer receives the value to reproduce those six hours and the capitalist receives the same amount of value expressed in the cotton in the hat. The seller of labour power, like the seller of any other commodity, realises its exchange value and parts with its use value. He cannot take the one without giving the other. The use value of labour power, or in other words labour, belongs just as little to its seller as the use value of oil, after it has been sold, belongs to the dealer who has sold it. The owner of the money has paid the value of a day's labour power. His, therefore, is the use of it for a day. A day's labour belongs to him. The fact that six hours labour is enough to keep the labour alive for 24 hours, however, does not prevent them in any way from working the whole day. The exchange value of labour power, the one pound for six hours work to sustain itself for a day, is a different magnitude to the use value of labour power, what it is possible of producing in a day. And it's precisely this use value that the capitalist desires. The labourer sells their labour power for its exchange value and gives away its use value to the capitalist. The labourer no longer owns its use value, just the same as I no longer own the use value of an apple after I sell it. The labourer sells a day's worth of labour in exchange for a day's worth of necessities. The labour power now belongs to the capitalist in the eyes of the law and for as long as they desire for the day. Let us return now to our example and say that the labourer now works for 12 hours making hats for the capitalist, each hat still taking six hours to make. The value of two rolls of cotton, 14 pounds, the value of one tool, four pounds, and the exchange value of labour power, one pounds, are purchased by the capitalist for 19 pounds. And at the end of the workday, they now have two hats, each with the value of 10 pounds. Our capitalist, after selling them on the market, has received back an extra one pounds from circulation. They have created one pounds of surplus value. If the capitalist works the labourer for 18 hours, he advances 28 pounds in capital to start and withdraws 30 pounds after circulation, after the three hats are sold on the market. Our labourer realised the exchange value of their labour power after six hours, but continues to perform the use value of labour power for the remaining hours worked. This period is where the surplus value is realised. It is the period that Marx calls the valorization process. It's when value is valorised, or from the point of view of the capitalist, the realisation of the increase of value, the prime in MCM prime. Here we contemplate the labour as producing a particular article. We view it under its qualitative aspect alone, with regards to its end and aim. But viewed as a value-creating process, the same labour process presents itself under a quantitative aspect alone. From the point of view of the capitalist, we understand that to obtain a surplus value, they must not only put the labourer to work for long enough to reproduce the labourer's labour power, but also for an extra amount to obtain a profit. The distinction here in the capitalist chase for profit now becomes one of quantity rather than quality. It no longer becomes about the use of labour power in making the qualitative aspect of use values, that is, the use of commodities, but rather how many or how much labour it can perform, how much surplus value it can create.